In 2006, a campaign of murder was carried out on the streets of Suffolk. Something was happening, you know, every 24 hours. The discovery of five bodies in 10 days would leave the community stunned and authorities overwhelmed. This was a story which was completely unprecedented. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. Made me wonder, you know, how many more are they going to find? And with it, the question, what had driven Steve Wright, this quiet middle-aged man, to commit his killing spree? Not in a million years you think he's ever capable of that. Why did this happen? I mean, that's the $65,000 question. Sunday, the 10th of December, 2006. The tranquil market town of Ipswich was gearing up for the holiday season. It was late night shopping and Christmas parties. Um, and uh, yeah, very much the lead up to the, uh, the festive period. However, despite the festive cheer, there was an undercurrent of unease. In early November, two girls had been reported missing from the streets of the red light district. By the 8th of December, both their bodies had been found dumped in a nearby brook, the disturbing discoveries separated by just six days. Senior investigating officer Roy Lambert would receive a phone call that would thrust him to the center of the newly unfolding drama. Sunday the 10th of December, I was at home about four o'clock when I got a phone call from Stuart Gull. He said, we've got a bit of a problem. So I said, well, what's happened now? And he said, we've had another, another body has been found of a young woman. On arriving at the location on the edge of the nearby village of Nacton, he would encounter a haunting scene. I remember when I arrived, uh, it was about just after four o'clock. Uh, it, was, it was then dark, it was really, really windy and the rain was absolutely lashing it down. Although the scene of this sinister crime gave no immediate clues to the identity of the killer, that of the victim was soon established. Quite early on, we, we could see from the scene some, uh, there were some tattoos which gave us an indication who this person may be. Uh, it wasn't a formal identification this early on the Sunday evening, but we sent some family liaison officers to the mother of uh, this young woman who turned out to be Anna Lee Alton. When I looked at the video which had been taken by the, the crime scene investigator of what uh, the position and how the body was, I was actually uh, shocked to, to, to see the image of Anna Lee lying uh, naked and, and posed in, uh, in the middle of these, uh, these woods. The killer's public display would give investigators an insight into the disturbed mind of the man responsible for this sadistic spree. She'd clearly been laid out by the offenders. She was in a cruciform position, so uh, her arms were out wide, um, and her hair, had, she had long uh, peroxide blonde hair that had been pulled back in a conical form. And um, she was pristine, she was very clean, and she was naked. Um, but clearly the offender had spent some time laying her out. I was thinking, what are we in the middle of here? This is the third girl taken off the streets of Ipswich, uh, found on land now in Woodland, so we didn't know what was happening really. The uncovering of a third body in only eight days would prove unnerving. It was almost a public display by the, by the killer because her body was left so close to the road. Um, it was clear that she'd be found pretty soon. Um, it seemed at that time almost as if the killer was perhaps taunting the police. Things were happening so quick, it was actually difficult to sort of comprehend and get, get a handle on what in fact was happening to us in Suffolk. The genuine shock and fear in Ipswich was ramped up a hundred times. 
Pretty early on, we found that Anna Lee was living in Colchester with a boyfriend. Initially, we sort of said to him, well, why haven't you reported her missing? And he did say, well, Anna Lee sometimes would go missing for two or three days at a time. He wasn't concerned about it. They, the last time he saw her, they were on good terms. And in fact, he said, she said she was going to go and see her mother uh, that afternoon and take some Christmas presents to her son. And in fact, uh, when we relayed that to her mother, her mother did confirm that. When we found out from Annalise's boyfriend that uh, we were going to, that she was going to go to Harwich to see her mother on the train, uh, obviously a lot of trains have CCTV these days, and uh, so we we looked, and in fact we did obtain some footage of her actually on the train coming back from Harwich towards Manningtree on that Sunday night, the 3rd of December. It gave us a starting point from when she was last, one of the times she was last seen alive. Uh, it also gave us a description of what she was wearing what she was carrying, uh, which is important for us, that if we found any clothing uh, subsequently. And in fact, we got her uh, not only on the train, we found further CCTV of her at the railway station and also later on the outskirts of the red light area, later on on that Sunday, the uh, 3rd of December. While the inquest into Anna Lee's death continued, the results of the autopsy would provide police with a new piece of the puzzle. The pathologist was able to give us a cause of death and uh, he, he described it as an interference with the airway, um, either uh, asphyxiation or strangulation. News of the discovery of Anna Lee's body would travel fast. We were all scared of our wits, thinking who's it going to be next, who's it going to be next. The media uh, interest just went into the stratosphere. Suddenly, resources right around the country were coming to Ipswich to really try and nail down who was doing this. Yet the killer was closer than anyone could have dared imagine. In 2006, Ipswich will be struck by a killing spree. In only six weeks, Five girls disappeared from the streets of the red light district, their bodies found over just 10 days. The 1st of October, 2006, London Road, Ipswich. 48-year-old forklift truck driver, Steve Wright, moved into a flat in the heart of Ipswich's red light area. Wright's younger brother, Keith, recalls a quiet life in their early years. I suppose my earliest memory that I can sort of really remember is he used to walk, sort of walk us all to school and stuff. I was probably only about five or six, I think. And Steve must be... was he, about 14, I think. But that's always good. I mean, it was always quite close as a family is that way. They had, obviously had arguments there between stepmum and stepchildren or whatever. Steve Wright's natural mother had left the family home in 1965. I think his parents divorced when he was quite young um, and he didn't see his, his mother particularly. He was brought up by his father, Conrad, um, who was in the services. His father would have lived by strict rules and he would have expected his son to do so. So if he ever stepped out of line, then he would have been very quickly and strongly put back into line. And so I think Steve's uh, childhood was spent moving around in different parts of the country as his dad was uh, dispatched to different um, parts of the, the UK to work. What he did become quite adept at was putting on a persona, an easygoing, affable, almost every man persona, so that people could get along with him easily. That may not have necessarily been the real Steve Wright. So his early years were ones where he clearly learned to talk the talk, and those were skills that he used to lethal effect later on. The exceptional story began in earnest on the 1st of November. 19-year-old Tanya Nicholl had disappeared without trace. Tanya was first reported missing, I think it was the 1st of November, 2006, uh, when she was reported missing by her mum. She caught the bus into town at just after 11 p.m. I think it was a Monday evening, um, clearly with the intention of uh, operating as a street prostitute. 
Roy Lambert would be called upon to review the facts of the case. Tanya would stand down here on this uh, corner of this junction, uh, and cars would uh, would come round and and they would stop and speak to the girls, uh, and they would discuss services. Uh, the girls would get in the car and off they would go and to do whatever they were going to do. But um, this was very uncharacteristic, and uh, Tanya's mum subsequently reported her as missing. With detectives puzzled by the disappearance, concerns would grow for Tanya's safety. And the alarm bells began to ring at that early stage, um, and Tanya literally disappeared off the face of the earth. Just two weeks later, on November the 15th, concerns were raised for the safety of a second missing girl, 25-year-old Gemma Adams. She, too, had been last seen in the area surrounding London Road. Initially, it was only one girl gone missing, so there's nothing to really, as a force, to get too concerned about. It was when the second one was reported missing, the 14th or 15th of November, we thought, hmm, this is a bit unusual. Gemma Adams was reported as missing to us during the early hours of uh, that morning. Her boyfriend had taken her down into the uh, red light area to, to, do, to do some work uh, and he was anticipating seeing her after a, after a period of time and I think what happened was that she didn't come back. You know the sort of girls who would just go away and not come back for days and it's like oh they've just gone on a bend and they're doing whatever but you knew the girls who were sensible had their partners or whatever they wouldn't just that's not their normal routine to do that. Friends of Gemma were becoming worried for her safety. I know Gemma was a really kind person. She was a really nice person to talk to. She weren't a person who would double cross you, who would like be proper like nasty towards you or backstab you, steal off you or anything like that. She weren't that sort of person. She was the opposite, polite, nice. As the authorities gathered more evidence, their concern would grow also. Because of her lifestyle and the fact that uh, uh, she might have gone off with a client. Uh, initially, there was not great concern for that first couple of days, but then when the phone went off completely off the network, I mean, that was the big indication that something uh, serious might have happened to her. The 2nd of December, 2006, 11.40 a.m. Hintlesham. The developing story would open a haunting new chapter. The weather was exceptional for that time of the year. Everywhere was in flood. I got into the lakes, and because the floods had receded, the first thing I'd done was, well, not the first thing, I just checked the grounds, checked the lakes, then got my waders on, and then patrolled the brook. And I suddenly noticed, like a mannequin, you know, a dressmaker's dummy. Upon closer inspection, Trevor would find himself horrified at the true nature of his discovery. It was not until I'd got into the brook and got up right beside her and just moved the hair a little bit, moved the debris away from her hair. Then that is when I suddenly knew, or realised, that now it's a young body. And my first thought was, it's one of the missing girls. Well, at first, a shock and sort of maybe jump back a little bit. And then I had to sort of take control of myself and got straight out of the brook, still shaking, and phoned the police up. You know the, you know the exact time where I phoned them. Uh, 11.44 when I phoned them, I just phoned them up and said who I was, where I was, and that I'd just found the body of a young girl face down in the brook. Police would descend on the scene and begin their efforts to determine the identity of the unfortunate victim. When the report first came in, uh, because of the, the body had been in the water that long, we didn't initially know who this was. Uh, not until uh, we'd taken the body out of the water and got them back to the hospital and started to conduct our, our examinations did we identify who, who it was. The body was that of Gemma Adams, who had last been seen some two weeks earlier 
on the 15th of November. Friends had long suspected the worst. Gemma, when she first went, that's when I first knew that it had been a murder because she'd have never just gone off. That weren't her style. She wouldn't have just left and her boyfriend followed her about every night. So if you saw her boyfriend, you knew she was out because he'd be a couple of steps behind her and for her not to come back, that weren't, no way, that wouldn't happen. I'll never forget it. I shall never forget that day. I shall never forget the timings of that day. I shall never forget the night when they, um, it's something that's never gonna go away. With detectives now on the trail of a killer, they began looking closely at the emerging pattern. People say if you find out about the victim, you might find out uh, how they've died. The clues and list of likely suspects, however, were few and far between. When you get into this area of the sex industry dealing with uh, men who travel from a long way away, there's also some really interesting individuals. They were starting to look at clients, friends, and victimology of, of, of Gemma to find out you know, how she lived, who she associated with. There was no indications at this stage of who was responsible for her death. Since moving to London Road only a matter of months before, Steve Wright was already known as a regular client of the girls who worked the streets surrounding his home. His history of indulging in the world of the sex industry was long established. Steve Wright wasn't somebody who just suddenly woke up one morning and wanted to explore the sex trade uh, or go to a massage parlour to see what it was like. This was a man who'd been dipping his toe in and out of that life, his whole life. We saw the first uh, uh, example of that when he was travelling around the world uh, working on the QE2 to places that opened his eyes to these sorts of things. Wright would join the crew of the famous cruise liner in 1980, working as a steward and travelling the world. When he was on the sort of QE2, you always thought, oh, hey, it must be quite a smart old job. He'd tell us all the things, that, the travelling they got up to, and obviously a lot of hard work working on a place like that. In that kind of job, one's got to be affable and one defers to the customer. He'd do anything for everybody. He'd always help anyone out. If you wanted anything, he'd try and help you out with it. I'm very confident that he would have learned how to be a ladies' man. He would have learned how to be sociable. He would have learned how to make people feel at ease and relaxed about him. I met Stephen Wright probably in the summer of 81. He always had this sort of grin, like, a, like he was laughing inside. Um, and I was always a little bit uneasy around him. He kind of fancied himself to a degree. He was a bit of a sort of a ladies' man. I don't think he dated any, any on board women because there was, you know, very few ladies on there anyway. So um, whatever female company he wanted, he made use of it when we were uh, on the shore. A lot of the ports of call that we used to go to uh, we're all in the less salubrious parts of the town sort of thing, so the ladies that he met were ladies who wanted their payment, as it were, ladies of the night, kind of. The strains of a life at sea would eventually take their toll on Wright. Having divorced his wife, he would return to England in 1987. Some 19 years later, as the news of the grim discovery of Gemma Adams' body broke, the story began to gather momentum. Initially, when the two girls were missing, the, the interest locally, certainly with the media, was mixed. They were two girls uh, from the, the sex industry got missing, but of course, when one was found murdered, now it, uh, the interest with the media particularly was heightened. Local crime reporter Josh Warwick would be assigned to cover the case. It was a Saturday morning, and a police got in touch to say that a body had been found. Any murder is headline news in the, uh, in the local press. Um, and so for two girls to be missing, one of whom had been found by that stage, was, uh, was really frightening and really shocking. However, few could have prepared themselves for the next turn in this twisted tale. 
We then started to search the Belstead Brook. We used a police dive team to do this, and on the 8th of December, the police dive team had worked their way from Hintlesham towards Copdock, which is down, downstream towards the uh, River Orwell, and they unfortunately came across uh, the body of another uh, white naked female, and this later turned out to be Tanya. Tanya had been missing for nearly six weeks. The discovery of her body leading detectives to believe that they were now looking for one man on a killing spree. So we now quickly move from what was two missing vulnerable young women to a double murder inquiry. I heard about it as soon as she'd been found because the police had their incident vans and the rest of it at our place at the fisheries. And when I got down the next morning, that all disappeared. And that's when I found out that they'd found Tanya a few miles downstream. Just six days on from the discovery of Gemma Adams, the revelation of a second body being found would make waves across the country. I got a phone call from the news desk. My news editor said, look, you know, this doesn't look good. Don't pack for a night. You know, I would pack for the best part of a week. We don't know where this is going. So I arrived up in uh, Copdock to the uh, scene of where this second body uh, had been found, Tanya Nickel. It was pouring with rain through the sort of windshield of the uh, car. You could see in the distance the uh, police car lights, the blues and, and twos, which were flashing. The road was blocked off. And suddenly what had once felt like perhaps a very short trip for an isolated very tragic death of a young woman now took on a slightly more sinister angle. As Christmas approached in 2006, Ipswich would be plagued by a killer on a ruthless spree. Beginning with the disappearance of 19-year-old Tanya Nicholl in early November, by the 8th of December, Tanya's body and that of Gemma Adams had been found in a brook on the outskirts of Ipswich. While the town came to terms with the grave situation, an ominous atmosphere began to envelop the area. A little bit of unease started to creep in, like not wanting to walk out on your own over night time once it got dark and making sure your children were okay and escorting them everywhere. It was a culture of fear in many respects. Um, there were more police on the streets, handing out rape alarms to women. Friends of the street girls noticed the increased police presence was not welcomed. To be honest, a lot of the girls was pissed off about it because you couldn't get the money. So with the police being there, they couldn't go and get what they needed to get anyway. So yeah, you felt a bit safe, but at the same time, they're all shouting at them because they want them to go away because they want, do you know what I mean? They want people to be driving around. So, because otherwise you're not gonna, you're going out there for nothing, really. Then on the 10th of December, just two days on from finding the body of Tanya Nicholl, a third horrifying discovery was made. When I got a call from the force control room to say that a motorist had driven through the street at Nacton, and this motorist reported finding what appeared to be the naked body of a, uh, of a female. My mind was racing when I got this call, because you're immediately thinking, you know, who is it? Um, and as we now know, that was the body of Anna Lee Alderton. Found laid out and posed in a cruciform position, the disturbing ritual demonstrated that the killer was becoming ever bolder. Unlike Tanya and Gemma before her, 24-year-old Anna Lee had not been reported missing, making the revelation of her untimely end all the more shocking. I got a phone call um, from the news desk and they said, something on the lines of, you know, you're not, you're not going to believe it, um, but the police have just announced that they've found the body of a third woman. 
Suddenly, tension raised several notches. Are we now talking about a serial killer? Are we talking about somebody picking off young women right from under the police's noses? Living in the heart of the area from where the girls were disappearing, Steve Wright had a history of violent behaviour towards women. He had a track record for being uh, brutal, for being violent, um, against his two previous wives. We've got an individual who would, would, would batter his partners, and we know that that's usually a hallmark symptom of men who feel inadequate, who feel they can't cope, who feel they're not in control of the relationship and they don't feel uh, terribly manly, that they lack something in their machismo. Steve Wright was all about trying to be something he wasn't, uh, trying to live out uh, or find excitement in his life. And it was pretty tough. It's tough for a lot of people to, to find excitement. Um, he found it in, in prostitution. He also found it in gambling. It meant that he built up debts. By the year 2000, Steve Wright's life was in steady decline. With drinking and gambling taking their toll, Wright had accrued 40,000 pounds of debt, yet he continued his habit of paying for sex. Graduating from the massage parlors he would formerly frequent, Wright began to take his fantasies out into the open. Money gets tight, you have uh, responsibilities, bills to pay, suddenly it makes more sense to be out on the streets where you can turn a trick for 20 quid uh, rather than 50, 60, 70 pounds uh, in a massage parlour. And so that's how we find eventually Steve Wright coming out onto the streets rather than doing what he did to get his kicks behind closed doors. Later that same year, Wright would hit the bottom of his spiralling depression. Like he tried to top himself at one time, just for everything got to him. And uh, then he sort of came back, uh, like they have done when they ever get in trouble, and normally come back home to see the dad and that, and he came back here. Dad sort of set him up. This was a man either crying out, hoping he'd get caught, uh, or being an attention seeker on the one hand, uh, or this was a man who genuinely felt that his life was that tragic that he just needed to be here no longer. After working in a succession of small-time jobs, Wright eventually took employment at the Felixstowe docks. When he got to come back here, he just went more and more silent about things, and he wouldn't sort of chat about nothing, really. He went more into himself and quiet and non-confrontational to anybody. Dad set him up at his, then he got the job down on the docks. Everything was going well. And we sort of, well, that's him sort of settled for now. He was now involved in uh, another long-term-ish relationship. And she has a normal job where the evenings are spent together. But then there's a change in job. Suddenly, his partner is now working night shifts. So Steve Wright finds himself sitting in London Road in the middle of the red light district with an opportunity to fulfill his fantasies. While Wright struggled with his personal life, the pace of the unfolding story playing out on the streets of Suffolk continued to accelerate. By this stage, three women had been found in the space of li little over a week. That, that speed at which things were developing um, just meant there was shock upon shock upon shock. The 12th of December, 2006, Levington. Six weeks on from the disappearance of Tanya Nicholl, the first girl to go missing. Just 24 hours after uncovering the body of third victim, Annalee Alderton, detectives would be struck by a sickening double discovery. I became aware that another sex worker called Paula Clannell had been reported missing by her boyfriend. He was concerned because he'd naturally heard what's on the radio and seen what was on the television. And then what happened again? There was another sex worker reported missing, Annette 
Nichols was reported missing by her mother. She'd been trying to get hold of Annette by her phone, no reply, so she became very, very concerned about why she couldn't get hold of Annette, so she reported her missing. I can remember going to the police headquarters after Anne-Lee Alderton's body had been found and identified, and there was a press conference. We were handed a press release, uh, which we weren't expecting, telling us that there were two more women who'd been reported missing. Um, and I can just remember phoning the news desk and saying, this is not just about the third girl who, whose body's been found, there are two more missing. What is going on here? What are we involved with? This is like a, a whirlwind of all these incidents keep happening. I mean, something was happening sort of, you know, every 24 hours. Close friend Sarah Grimwood had been one of the last people to see Paula before she disappeared. Me, another friend and Paula, and at the time my boyfriend, we were all in a house together. I thought she was staying in, I didn't think she was going to go out. And then I said to her, are you going to stay in tonight now? She did say yeah, but then when her stuff was gone, she changed her mind. And then the next day, she didn't come round mine and knock on the door like she does every day. Eager to locate the newly missing girls, the police would appeal for information. I would ask either the girls themselves or anyone with information as to their whereabouts. And I can remember appealing certainly throughout that Monday for anybody that uh, knew of the whereabouts of Annette or Paula to make contact with us. They quickly ascertained that certainly, uh, as it turned out, both Paula and Annette, I think they'd both been last seen alive about the 8th of December. So we're now the 12th of December, so there's four sort of days there which uh, this window we've got to sort of try and close down. And probably naively, I thought that they'd make contact with us or somebody would. Their appeals, however, would prove futile. The 12th of December, a member of the public is walking along the old A14 at Levington, which isn't far from Nacton, and uh, he sees in uh, the foliage about seven or eight yards in from the road, what he believes is the body of a white naked female. We've got a force helicopter, and in major crimes like this, it's, a, it's good practice. They asked the helicopter to have a fly over the scene and have a look around, so they went, the helicopter was put up. We're quickly able to see a video downlink on screen, and I can remember seeing the crumpled body of a, of a naked female. Um, and as it turned out, that was the body of Paula Clennon. The helicopter goes up and sees where the member of the public is and sees that first body. And then they naturally, they, they then start to slowly work their way out from there. And what happened then is unbelievable. I will need you at some point to go, all right? Uh, and I can remember turning away from the screen and speaking to the inspector. Um, and then turning back to the screen and a second image caught my eye. And I could see that it was the image of a naked female, but it was in a different form to that of Paula. And um, this female was in a cruciform position, much like Anna Lee had been found. And it takes a few seconds for the brain to catch up with what the eye is seeing. Um, and of course it quickly dawns on me that this is a second body. And as we now know, that was the body of uh, Annette Nichols. I mean, I've never known anything like this in over 40 years of being in the, in, in the police. in fact the first one to be found on the, the 12th, on Tuesday the 12th, and this was the one that uh, the member of the public found. And Paul was found just seven or eight yards in. I didn't cry at first because I didn't, I didn't believe it, do you know what I mean? I didn't, you don't believe it at first because you're so scared yourself, you don't want to believe it, do you know what I mean? Because that's, that's a big thing. That's a big part of my life, which, that's really hard, really, do you know what I mean? It's, 
have to think about. That's where uh, the tributes are to where Annette now. Annette was found not obviously right by the side of the road, but uh, about 10 yards in. Detectives were faced with the reality of chasing down an increasingly reckless killer, one believed to be responsible for the murder of five young women. It was almost seen audacious, you know. It was almost a killer mocking the police in a way and saying, I can get away with this right under your noses. Were the offender or offenders, were they enjoying this or were they being panicked into uh, some sort of activity? Was it all coming to a, a crescendo? Whoever this was, he was losing control. The pressure on the police was enormous. We just didn't know what was going to happen next. With the stakes of this savage spree escalating ever higher, the killer's deadly designs would be undone by his previous sins. The only way they were able to track him down was through DNA evidence of a crime that he committed, you know, dozens of years prior. In December 2006, an elusive killer stalked the streets of Ipswich's red light district, preying on the girls who plied their trade. Disappearing over four weeks, the bodies of five vulnerable young women had been found in only 10 days. With detectives under increasing pressure to close their net around this violent predator, DNA evidence would prove the key that would crack the murderous code. We'd managed to obtain some DNA from the Annalee scene. And when the forensic scientists had processed this through and looked on the National DNA Database, this same DNA uh, profile came up as being Stephen Wright. He'd been dealt with for theft whilst employed as a barman at a hotel in Felixstowe in 2001, I think it was. So here we are five years later, and uh, all the indications are that he's a serial murderer. That DNA sample was his big downfall. Had he never taken that money, had he never got into debt, uh, then the police quite possibly would never, ever have found him. With Steve Wright now firmly in the police's sights, they would move to get their man. With regard to the arrest of Steve Wright, uh, he was arrested in the early hours of the 19th of December. It was about, about 5 a.m. He was uh, arrested at his home address. He was up. He was getting uh, prepared to go to work. So he was uh, arrested and taken into custody. It was interesting, his reaction, he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't say much at all, uh, was, was quite shocked. And in fact, he needed to be given some time to recover. The prime suspect would maintain a steadfast silence in the face of questioning. He certainly never said, uh, you've got it all wrong, I'm innocent. He was, uh, he didn't hardly say anything at all. He was taken to a police station in Suffolk. He was interviewed with, it, with a solicitor by trained officers, uh, but he made no comment all the way through. We've got the last girl to go missing with your DNA and the one before with your DNA both on their naked bodies. How can that be? No comment. Here was a guy who had been arrested on suspicion of five murders uh, who was refusing to comment, which didn't fit with the, uh, the kind of profile of an innocent man wrongly arrested. As news spread of the arrest, Steve Wright's family would be astounded by the accusations. Well, it's total shock, to be honest. I mean, I was at work the night before. We were all talking about it, and to wake up sort of that morning to find out that your brother had been sort of arrested. I suppose unbelievable is the only word you can think of. From just having a run-of-the-mill, normal sort of family setup as such, to now knowing that one of your family was suspected of this serial killings was people are going to remember for years. As the face of the so-called Suffolk Strangler made the front pages, people were surprised by the vision of a man who appeared to be the very image of ordinary. 
pictures began to emerge and he didn't look like perhaps the, the killer that we'd imagined he would look like. A middle-aged man, slightly overweight, um, slightly balding, fairly regular looking guy. One of the reasons why Wright was able to operate efficiently in the way he did is that he didn't look, act or seem to be a serial murderer. He had a job, he had a partner, he had a domestic life. That ordinariness is what allows him to literally get right up close and next to the girl and persuade them to get into the car. It's the banality of evil. The police would begin to gather evidence and build a case against the man they believed responsible for the slayings of five young women. And of course, you know, for the police, the arrest was almost the easy bit. It was the work that would come after that that was the, um, the real challenge for them, you know, to prove that they had got the right man beyond all reasonable doubt. There was no smoking gun, and I think the prosecution admitted that, but uh, there was a real picture that was painted by the prosecution. There was DNA evidence, and there was fibre evidence uh, taken from his car. He had a, a, a dark blue Ford Mondeo ZTEC, which we took possession of and conducted forensic examination of that. This vehicle did in fact become relevant and was seen on CCTV in different parts of the red light area during sort of November, December 2006. He was confident enough and believed he was clever enough that some risks, such as using his own car, were acceptable risks. But it was CCTV that got him. I mean, that is, that is error 101 in your serial murderer's handbook, is CCTV. So when you put all this together, we had all this evidence which linked all the girls and Steve Wright, and it, like, closed the circle. The trial would be keenly awaited. Yet Wright would offer little defence in answer to the prosecutor's probing questions. I remember really clearly in the trial when Wright took to the stand to give evidence. Under cross-examination, there were dozens of questions. Uh, the evidence was put to him, you, you know, is this just a coincidence? All his answer was, it appears so, yes. He said it 20 or 30 times, and it just continued to kind of paint this image of somebody who was, who was guilty. After more than five weeks at trial, the jury would deliver a unanimous verdict, finding Steve Wright guilty of the murders of Tanya Nichol, Gemma Adams, Anna Lee Alderton, Paula Clennell, and Annette Nichols. He would receive a sentence of life imprisonment with a recommendation that he spend the rest of his days behind bars. When the five guilty verdicts came back, there was, there was clearly a huge relief on the part of the police, definitely the members of the public. Um, but I think probably most of all, family members were just so relieved that, uh, that justice had been done. Although the man responsible had been sentenced, questions about the motivations of this most complex of characters remained. The five murders that Wright was convicted of were all committed in his late 40s, which is, statistically speaking, a very late age for a serial killer. There is a possibility that he could have a very long offending history going back many years. I think, my God, you know, I, I, I drank with this guy, I went on the shore leave with him, and now he's a, a, a serial killer. You know, just killed five women within four weeks. You know, you don't just do that, you know, I mean, then your mind goes back and races back. Do you think, was it possible that he started when he was on the ships? Uh, and then you think, well, my feelings I had towards him with the uneasiness, was he, was he doing it there and then? It could be that, that living out these sexual fantasies he'd held for a long time could be the, the one last roll of the dice he might have of, of, of achieving something, of doing something interesting that most men couldn't possibly imagine doing. Despite his conviction, the mystery of why Steve Wright chose to take the lives of five innocent women in just six weeks remains a riddle only he can answer. Because he's never made any comment, we don't actually still know to this day how this all happened. How did he get control of these girls? How did he manage to isolate them and murder them and, and get away with it? Until he decides to tell his side of the story and tell us what happened, I don't think we're ever going to know.